Isaac Newton is one of the most famous scientists in history. Known for his scientific contributions to our understanding of light, universally accepted laws of motion, and gravity. Despite academic battles with his critic Robert Hooke and suffering from several nervous breakdowns throughout his life, he was able to achieve far more accomplishments than he's typically known for, going on to serve as the UK's Master of the Mint for the last three decades of his life going undercover and using disguises to take down counterfeiters that had falsely printed an estimated 20% of the British's total currency in circulation in the late 1600s. He also instituted currency quality measures that would go on to save the UK millions of pounds, shaping the economy and dedicating his twilight years to bringing the counterfeiting criminals to justice. This is the life of Isaac Newton, and this is Learn Something New. Isaac Newton was born on the 4th of January in 1643 in Woolsthorpe, Lincolnshire, England. He was brought into the world prematurely and was extremely weak. His father, also named Isaac, was a wealthy farmer in his community but had passed away three months before his son was born. Because of the conditions in which he was born, Newton wasn't expected to survive, and when he was just three years old, his mother remarried to another wealthy man. But instead of bringing her child with her, she left him in the care of his grandmother, not being reunited with his mom until after her second husband died nine years later. When she returned, she brought along three more children, all from her second marriage. Although Isaac had been attending school up to this point, where he had been introduced to math and chemistry, two subjects that he found to be fascinating, when his mother returned, she pulled him out of school at the age of 12, compelling him to take up farming like his father before him. But he hated it, finding it too boring and difficult for his liking. It wouldn't be long before he was sent back to school, mostly because his uncle persuaded Newton's mother to allow him to. By the time he arrived at the University of Cambridge, there were already significant advancements being made as part of the scientific revolution of the 17th century. During his first three years at the college, Newton went through the usual curriculum, but found himself drawn to the bleeding edge of the scientific advancements. But because he was so focused on learning beyond what was being taught, with additional strain on his time from working as a caretaker on the side, his grades suffered. He still performed well in school, but at the end of his degree, he graduated without honors. After further education, Newton would eventually take on the role as professor at Cambridge. It was during a two-year stint of the university closing its doors to students because of the bubonic plague resurfacing in Europe that Newton would return to his family's farm, pondering ideas about math, light, and color, and it would be here, as legend would have it, that Newton would have his famous encounter with an apple that would shape his theories on the laws of motion. The apple never actually hit him on the head, as is often believed, but he likely did witness one fall, making him consider why it might fall straight down rather than at some angle. It was during these two years that he would lay the groundwork for some of his most famous contributions to science, including calculus, his laws of motion, and his theory of light and color. When returning back to the world of academics and publishing his theories, he saw that some admired his ideas, but notably, a more experienced scientist who was highly regarded in several areas like mechanics and optics found issue with Newton's work. Newton had theorized that light was composed of particles, while Hooke was of the opinion that light acted as waves. Today, we understand that light acts as both particles and waves, with the particle being a photon and the flow of photons being a wave. So although both men were technically right at the time, their two ideas seemed to be at odds with one another. Hooke almost immediately condemned Newton's work, attacking nearly every part from his methodology to his conclusions. Others also took issue with Newton's work, but since Hooke was one of the original members of the Royal Society, the oldest independent scientific academy which dedicated itself to excellence in science, his words stung far more than any others. Newton denied Hooke's criticism in a rage, and nearly quit in his role in the Royal Society, only deciding to stay when others assured him that Hooke's critiques were not universally agreed upon either, and that Newton was better off staying than going out on his own. While he would stay in the Royal Society, Newton would have a nervous breakdown in 1678 and withdraw himself from society, choosing instead to study gravity and its effects on the orbits of planets far removed from his peers. Six years later, he returned, helping Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame with the mathematical proof of planetary motion. Following Newton's publication of the Principia, Newton decided to move down a new path, networking outside of Cambridge and meeting other academics like John Locke, 
Newton would lead a group of young scientists who more closely shared his scientific interpretation of the natural world, but within just a few years, he had yet another nervous breakdown. The reason for this one is less clear, but some of the letters written by Newton to some of his friends in London came across as paranoid and conspiratorial, perhaps suggesting that he was slowly succumbing to mercury poisoning after decades of attempting to practice alchemy. Though this paranoia seemed to be brief, with him sending letters apologizing to friends a few months later. However, his interest in alchemy would only grow over time, mostly working on it as a hobby in his free time. But after taking some time to recover, Newton was chosen for a governmental position that would go on to take up much of his time for the last 30 years of his life. In 1696, Newton became the master of the mint for the UK. Newton had been trying for this position for some time, with some historians believing that his interest came from his alchemic attempts to turn regular materials into gold. But from an economic standpoint, the British Royal Mint was desperate for change. In the two decades preceding his appointment as the master of the mint, British currency counterfeiting had been hitting an all-time high, with Newton writing that around 20% of all currency collected for a study in the 1690s turning out to be counterfeit. Knowing that this level of fake currency in circulation could have severe implications on the value and trust in British currency, Newton made tackling counterfeiting one of his prime directives. Even before he became master of the mint, counterfeiting was a high crime punishable by death, but Newton would aggressively seek out the massive forgery operations, ensuring that their leaders were promptly executed. To find these places, he went undercover, disguising himself and hiding out in places where counterfeiters might try to launder fake coins into circulation, including bars, taverns, and anywhere criminals might frequent. He also hired a team of private investigators to tail suspects to find their counterfeiting equipment, and to help prevent further issues, he developed assaying procedures, or ways that they could test if the coins were legit by checking the purity of the precious metals they were made of. He also helped standardize the coins, knowing that once they were able to, they could more easily identify those that weren't officially minted. In all, Newton single-handedly brought 28 counterfeiters to justice with mathematician Ari Belinke calculating that the measures he instituted saved the UK 10 million pounds. After living the last years of his life with his niece near Winchester, England, Isaac Newton would pass away in his sleep on March 31st, 1727, being buried in Westminster Abbey. After his death, numerous works were found relating to Newton's study of religion and the Bible, exploring concepts like miracles, prophecy, and the extent of God's power promptly being published despite his lifelong wish for privacy in his theological beliefs. Though he was born near the advent of the scientific revolution, his scope of interest and impactful contributions made him more akin to the Renaissance men of centuries prior, a scientist willing to question our understanding of the world and helping lay the groundwork for future scientific exploration. Newton was never content with research and theorizing, also dedicating the last third of his life to improving the economic longevity of his country, truly earning the title of one of the greatest minds in history. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed this video and feel like you learned something new, please consider leaving a like. And we now have a Patreon. If you want to help support the channel financially so we can continue making videos like this one, check out the Patreon link in the description below. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.